when I was thinking how to convey to you some concept about technology and technological change, uh, first of all, I thought, OK, let's make the slides the same <coughs> color of the TED conference, so you see red, black, and white, so they will remember it for sure. Then I thought, maybe mm, this won't work completely, so uh, I had the idea to change the tone of my voice, as Professor Schweinberger said today, and that would fit, uh, but I was not able to realize that in the few hours that was separating his speech to my speech, so I said, OK, let's try to, since all the talks here were very nice, very inspiring, I thought, let's go on the dark side. So I'm sure that since all of you are young, uh, I'm still thinking that I'm uh, young. Uh, so all of you somehow had fear of the dark, right? I still have. So I don't turn off my light when I um, go to sleep. So I said, let's talk about monsters. You will see how I try to connect monsters and technology. Uh, then, you know, all of you also saw the Disney movie Monsters and Co., so you know that monsters are not always so bad and so scary. And first of all, to give you an introduction or somehow a, a first idea of what I'm going to say, um, as Professor Kant, as Dr. Savin, and as many others here in Jena, I'm an economist of innovation. So what I'm trying to do, or what we are trying to do, is to try to use economic theory, economic tools, the tools that economic theory provides us to explain technological change, to explain innovation. It is not easy. Why? Because actually it is also demanding, even if it is very interesting, because usually economics uh, provides us theory that talk about equilibrium, okay, so statics. Things don't want to move, don't want to change. But when you talk about technology, you talk about restless change. Actually, you talk about acceleration. So the point is that how do you fit a dynamic idea into a static context? It's like when you want to try to drive your car, but you have to stick into your garage, you know? It doesn't fit that well. So we have a task with, as an economist of innovation that is try to do dynamics, uh, also dealing and talking with static theories. Nevertheless, and despite the difficulties of a theory like that, um, it is important. Why it is important? Why here in Vienna, for example, we talk a lot about economics and innovation, economics and technology. It is important because to understand how technology evolves, so to understand, to understand how innovation uh, introduced in the society, in the economy, uh, means to understand uh, the direction of evolution of our world, of our society. So it's at the very base of the evolution of the world we live in. If you understand technology, maybe you understand also where we are headed to. So we kind of understand the future we are trying to construct, in the good and in the bad. The first step, here we're not yet talking about monsters, but they will come at a certain point. Uh, the first point, if you want to study uh, innovation, technological change, is to uh, realize that, uh, and this, black, uh, this red uh, spot helps me because I'm tending to move very much, but uh, is, is to realize that technologies are not all alike. So we usually tend to think about technology as something that reduces cost or introduces new products, but technology has different degrees, have different uh, um, levels of importance. So some of them are small, incremental changes to what already exists. Other technologies are just more radical. They are revolutionary. They bring about strong, big changes in the world we live in. Actually, the point is that, uh, and this is an interesting point for an economist of innovation, an economist of technological change, is that to distinguish between the radical and the incremental is not that easy. For example, take a car, take an auto. Okay, this is a classic, uh, classical car that you may just see in very some special occasions nowadays. Uh, and take a very new car. I cannot tell you the brand of this car, but I can tell you that it runs on electricity. And uh, uh, the name of the firm producing it uh, uh, is the name of a scientist uh, of the past. Um, if you think about these two cars, you may think that actually. Uh, the distance that separates these two uh, in terms of technology is not so much. They somehow provide the same function. They transport you somewhere, okay? You may want to enjoy the journey, you may just want to arrive where the car has to lead you to, but still, they do the same thing, okay? It's a mechanical device. But actually, if you would be able to check what is inside the second car, the newest car, you would find that that car uh, runs 
on very different principles. It's a very different kind of technology. While if you turn the steering wheel in the first car, you provide a sort of uh, uh, mechanical motion, moving the steering wheel or using the steering wheel in the second car will lead or will start the process of electronic change, okay? So everything will be driven by electronics. So if you look at the design, if you look at the function, there is an incremental change, a small change apart from the aesthetics. Um, but someone may also like the first one more. If you look at the technology, at the paradigm on which the second technology, the second car uh, works, then the two, things, uh, the two cars are very different and there is a revolutionary change behind, okay? A revolution from uh, mechanics, standard mechanics, to electronics, to information. Okay, so it's not that easy to distinguish between radical and non-radical innovation. How all these technological change, how all this complexity of technological change relates to monsters. Well, let's do a thought experiment. I'm not the first one who asked for a thought experiment, but it's always nice. So imagine a little body, okay, a little organism, or let's say I will describe you a couple of organisms, uh, a little very tiny body that lives together with a huge population of tiny bodies. They are very small, they don't have eyes, they don't have mouth, they just have three legs. They stick together in a very tiny place and they can just convey information and talk to each other at a very fast pace. This looks like, I don't know, a bacteria or something like that, something that you wouldn't eat or at least something kind of scary, right? And if you enlarge the sides, you can think about a giant organism. For example, an organism that gets fed with very strange food, very intangible food, but given that, produce continuous, continuous, and continuous motion. Then go on, go further, and imagine another organism. Very scary this time. This organism may have legs, may not, but for sure it has just one arm. And even if it has just one arm, this arm is so strong that it can lift uh, very big weights, a house, a truck, or something like that. This is really scary. This is really monstrous, I would say. And we can go even further. You can imagine uh, a bird or something like a bird. It's an organism that flies, but can also fly horizontally or vertically. It has no eyes, so you cannot see. It can be really useful, but it may be dangerous. Many birds are dangerous, actually, but this one, uh, I don't like birds too much, but uh, <laughs> this, is, this is even more. So these are all kind of monsters, if you think about that. But actually what I described to you is just a transistor, okay, a steam engine, a crave, and a drone. This is why I told you they may be useful, but also dangerous. So when new technologies are introduced into the market, into the society, so when they pass from invention to innovation, they somehow, uh, from the point of view of the economy and the society, this novelty may look, some, they may look like a monstrosity, okay? We don't really understand them. We have to understand them. So they may look like monsters. They are difficult to be, their concept to be grasped, their function to be grasped, but still you get the idea they may uh, give rise to a nice amount of surprise, a nice amount of change. Since we are economists, we want to know how will such a monster behave in the market, so which be, will be the effect of the monster to appear in the market, uh, and how markets will behave reacting to the presence of monsters. So how is interaction, how is incentive changing when monsters are around? That's really an economic question, but sometimes as, an eco as economists we can ask for help to biologists, okay? So we can see what is mm, researched uh, or somehow what is thought about in biology. In evolutionary biology, they have the same problem, okay? The one that I told you before. A technology is a radical technology or is an incremental technology. In biology, you have change, evolution. Is a, ch is a continuous or a discrete? Uh, kind of process. Usually, if you read Darwin, uh, he said, natura non facit saltus, meaning that nature does not jump. Okay, so the proce process of evolution is just a continuous process. There are no jumps. There are no discrete, abrupt changes. But actually, in very recent, uh, or let's say recent uh, 
advancement in evolutionary biology, in evo-devo theory, they start to think that actually jumps may take place. So also evolution is kind of a more complicated process than one, the one Darwin expected. And they introduced the concept of hopeful monsters. Hopeful monsters are those kind of organisms that actually create a new species. So unexpectedly, they have a jump in the genome. So not just a small random variation, but really big modification. Okay? The theory at the beginning was object of uh, uh, jokes somehow, and now it's becoming quite uh, common in evolutionary biology, or at least it's gaining success. So there are hopeful monsters in biology. Those monsters, because they are new, but they're also hopeful because they want to diffuse uh, in the world. For technologies, the same. Some technologies, not all of them, but some technologies are monsters because they lie between the known and the unknown. They create surprise, they emerge from uncertainty, so you cannot expect them, you cannot forecast them. They exploit natural phenomena, you think about a 3D printer, something like that. They exploit natural phenomena in ways that were not exploited before, so in an in unexpected way. But they are also, these kind of monsters, uh, hopeful, because they struggle for success. They want to become successful, uh, pervasive in the economy. So the question that an economist can ask uh, is, when we borrow this idea of hopeful monster from biology, is how an hopeful monster become pervasive? In biology, actually, as in physics, you know that Max Planck uh, uh, was changing his uh, major from economics to physics because economics was too difficult, right? <laughs> so uh, in, in biology, which is not simple at all, but maybe micro changes sum up over time, you don't, you don't see them because the genome does not make them to show, in the show up in the phenotype, and then at a certain point they just pop up. So there is the macro change, the macro evolution, uh, the jump uh, at a certain point. In, econo in the economy, things are even more uh, complicated. You are not cells, you are much more complex uh, organism uh, and uh, organizations, so uh, things become even more complicated. So to understand uh, if an hopeful monster can be successful or not, we have to go more in deep. More precisely, we need to analyze uh, two dimensions. First of all, if this hopeful monster is superior to other uh, things, uh, to other technology from the technical point of view, and if it is viable. So from the economic point of view, it can be introduced in the, in the social world. And this has to do with costs. So maybe one technology is cheaper than the other, and you may want to analyze that. Maybe uh, related to returns or opportunities or expectations. So what do you expect to gain out of the introduction of this technology? It may be uh, an effect of competition. So maybe I'm not alone in the economy. Maybe there are other technologies that struggle for success, OK? There may be a role or a space for demand. You may be the best, uh, you, the technology can be the best uh, ever in terms of technical superiority. But if nobody wants it, if the function it supply does not help uh, any kind of need of the society, then it does not diffuse. Then, of course, technology comes not alone, usually they come in bunches, so also the friends of the hopeful monsters are important. So those technologies that are complementary. If complementarities are there, then maybe this hopeful monster becomes even more hopeful and hover even more successful. Scale is important, how many people use this technology, to which place, space, uh, area you apply this technology. How old is this technology? You know that technology, as people, changes over time. They get standardized, they get better in their design over time. So there may be a differential effect in the success if the technology is very new or if it is older. And moreover, technologies are connected, like people in social network. So the point is that this connection may raise the return or reduce the cost uh, or ease competition, for example, and make a technology successful or not. Uh, here we, we have a study about that, or we are working on a study about that. Since we are economists, we always like to, to draw graphs. Uh, and if you imagine, for example, I have to make it simple because I don't have too much time, but if you imagine that on the x-axis you have all the markets, so all the economic activities in a continuum that goes from zero to one, and you represent, uh, this, you, you rank these activities 
uh, with respect to the returns or rewards that they can have um, from the new technology. And you imagine that there is a new technology, the hopeful monster and the established technology that is the, let's say, technology that everyone uses uh, in the market. You, cannot, you, you can also use it now to understand, for example, manual work against robotization, okay? So robotization may be a hopeful monster to transform the society. And you have the relation, uh, uh, this is a relative curve that explains the technological factors that I told you before and the economic factor. The intersection just tells you which part of the whole market is served by the hopeful monster and which part is served by the established technology. At this point, the, established tech, the full monster is just a niche in the market. What we, as, an, as economists, we can do is to study the variables that compose this function, that compose these relations, okay? It may be that costs are changing, that returns are increasing or decreasing, that competition becomes lower uh, or that demand uh, increase or decrease. And so, for example, if you play with these curves, you may find out that if, for example, the cost of one technology or the return of one technology increases with respect to the other, then the equilibrium changes, and this is why I told you that we try to fit dynamics in a static room. Uh, then the, the thing can change, and the hopeful monster can increase its share in the market. Many economic activities can use this hopeful monster that, even bec that becomes an even more hopeful monster, while the established technologies shrink. So there are many variables that affect uh, the success uh, of an hopeful monster. In biology, and I try to conclude, Hopeful monsters start a new species. And then these new species compete for dominance. In the economy, the technological hopeful monsters start a new possible trajectory for the society, which means an alternative path that we may decide to follow or not to build our future. This relates to a very, very general question we can ask when we study economics, technology, and society. That is, are there universal law for technolo technological evolution as there are for natural evolution? Which is the role played by hopeful monster? Which is the role played by revolutionary technology? Can we forecast or understand them better? So the point and the suggestion is that, that collecting more theory, getting interested, getting inspired by this kind of uh, stories and hypotheses uh, will make us able to better guide policy and to identify which are the viable alternatives uh, for our society. This is why in the end, uh, as I told you, Monsters & Co. is an example, but you shouldn't be scared by monsters. It means that you shouldn't be scared of what you do not, do not understand. Maybe the monsters of today are just the wonder of tomorrow. So they are just the wonder of what makes our world of tomorrow changing. Thank you very much.